Joel, for being here so early in the morning. I'll try to not annoy you. Um, so the, the first slide is maybe, the, the, maybe it, and it's, it's a very important one for me because this shows that it's, I'm not the only one talking. Well, I'm not the only one talking. I'm, I'm the right one standing here, but I'm not the only one working on this. And I started actually with Carmina Almudever, from, who happened to be from Valencia. Yeah, uh, she's sitting there. Yeah, so raise your hand so that people get to know you a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, and uh, she she started with me. Yeah, when when uh, our university started QTech, which is a quantum research center, which is a combination of the physics faculty as well as electrical engineering, mathematics, and computer science. That's where we are from. And so we just started brainstorming, like, what does it actually mean building a quantum computer? Yeah, and so uh, Carmina, she's one, she's present in, 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 in my life, yeah, in my scientific life from, from that moment. The other names, um, also I, I want to mention, and uh, you will see pictures at some point, yeah, so Nader Kamasi, he is a Tunisian guy, and um, um, he's now working at Intel, that's why behind his name now is, is, uh, is uh, Intel. Uh, Intel, as you know, has also decided to, to finance the work that we do in QTech because for them, they, they say that it's the first time that we hear a story about how to build a computer out of, out of all of these quantum phenomena that we're, that we're looking at. Um, Imran who, and Razvan, uh, they did both their PhD with me in Delft. Yeah, and, um, and, and Razvan, I, yeah, raise your hand also. Yes, sitting here also. Um, he's responsible for something that I will explain also later, which is a full stack implementation. Yeah, I will not go into too much detail. Yeah, so we're basically the three leading people of, of the quantum computer architecture lab yeah, uh, are sitting here uh, already this morning. So um, the first slide is this one. It's a little movie, there's no sound, yeah, but you saw that it's Elon Musk talking. Yeah. And why, why am I a fan of Elon Musk? Well, for various reasons, of course, for the Tesla, and, and, but, but space, especially for SpaceX, which is, a, which is a company he created to make the connection to Mars, where he wants to create a, a planet or some kind of a, a, a building space for, for humans to live, if in maybe 50 to 100,000 years, we, and you may not believe it, but this is the way that the scientists have proven, we have to leave this Earth, we have to leave this planet. And Elon is actually one of the first in many decades that, that takes the initiative to really create something on Mars. You've been, well, no, you've not been able to visit the, the museum, uh, the Science Museum in, in Valencia. I was there a couple of days ago with my kids, yeah, and uh, uh, there's a beautiful exposition about uh, the travel to Mars. And why, why am I talking about Elon Musk? It's not because I want to talk about Mars the entire evening, but I do think that quantum computing and you will hopefully understand a little bit more about quantum, yeah, is a fundamental property or technology that we will need in order to make that trans-universal kind of travel. Okay? So this is, a, this is a very short side note that I take, so I'll immediately switch away from it, because otherwise my young people, they say, yeah, well, whatever. Eh? Yeah, uh, but, uh, but for now, they all believe also a little bit in the same thing. So how does, where does quantum come from? Well, then we have to travel back, let's say, to the 20th century, and you see already the, the, the full names, yeah, uh, Albert Einstein and, and Niels Bohr. Yeah, the, the last one is a Danish guy, and, uh, and, uh, and Einstein was, uh, was a German. Yeah, and they were kind of debating a little bit on what is, what is possible. So Einstein looked at the large phenomena, the planets and the stars and how they interact with each other, and Niels Bohr was going into the, the actual, actual opposite, so going with a really small scale kind of uh, physics and what phenomena you see. And so that's why Einstein reacted like, yeah, no, God does not play dice. Yeah, that's a, like a famous quote. Yeah, but it's, it, you, you need to interpret it in that particular direction. So Niels Bohr, he said exactly the opposite, that, that there are a fundamental set of, of phenomena, which I will explain to a certain extent, that are very important in, in physics. And the, the third person, I will talk about him later, but uh, that's, that's uh, Richard Feynman, which we all know as a, as a brilliant uh, physicist. Yeah, and he actually was the, the incentive person of, uh, of making quantum computing a possibility. So let's first say something about what is quantum computing all about. And I, I just put here a logo, those who still know my, my good friend, unfortunately he died, and the, my predecessor in, in computer engineering in, in Delft, Stamatis Vassiliadis, 
He's a Greek guy, and he used this particular symbol as the, as the, as the logo for the computer engineering lab that, uh, that, we, that we started. So um, why do I, why do I uh, put this, this logo on? It's not because I want to make the fa how, how fancy we are in computer engineering. No. This is an analog computer. This is an analog computer of maybe more than a thousand years ago that was used to predict how moons and, and, and planets would, would interact and, and move in, in, in space. And I just highlight this because all of the quantum phenomena that we're working on yeah, and using are analog phenomena, not digital ones, analog. So we again are merging two different kinds of spaces together, like the digital as well as the analog computing environment. So that is why uh, this, this logo is shown here. So again, we have to, we have to the, uh, let, let's start with the classic uh, technology, which we all know. Yeah? We're all specialists in these things, so we all know bits. Yeah? Bits are either a zero or a one. That's a, that's a mutually exclusive state. So you're either a zero or, or a one. So that's why it says exclusive state. And you, you basically have the same in a quantum environment, which is now also zero and a one, but the symbols are a bit different. Yeah, there's a vertical and a bigger one is the bracket notation. Don't worry too much about that. Unless you go to our quantum tutorial later today, then you will need to, to dive into those kinds of things. Yeah? Uh, but it's, so also you can, you can have there an or situation. You're either a zero or, or the one. They say, yeah, well, now what is, so, what is so special about that? We have that in bits, so you have it in, in qubits, quantum bits. Well, in, 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 at the quantum level, you can also be in the zero and the one at the same time. So it is really a, what we call a superposition where either the zero and the one are at the same time valid and on which you can apply quantum gates or quantum logic and therefore you, you apply. So here you see the example of one qubit having two states, namely the zero and the one state, and you can have many base states, right? So that's the plus and the minus and the, and the zero and the one are the ones that we're mostly using in quantum computing, but you can basically have any kind of uh, base state. Now, what is important to know is that, that whatever quantum operation you apply on that, on that superposition, you apply it at the same time on those two states at the, uh, at, at, at the same time. So that's why at the, at the, lower, at the lower end here, you see the, the mathematical expression of the, the psi qubit, which consists indeed of the zero and the one, and then they're alpha zero and alpha one. And those are important things also to highlight because in the end, what we classically do, yeah, you compute something, well, you, you send me memory to, to a processor, the processor does something and sends back the result. And the result is stored in, into memory. And then when you want to read out the result, say, yeah, sure, what is in the, on that memory location? Fine. That does not go in quantum, does not go at all. Yeah, and I will explain that late, later on. But so you have to read out either the zero or the one state, and the probability with which you will do that depends on the alphas. So the alphas are kind of the amplitude. And in a different way, yeah, I will show it on, on this slide, yeah, the alphas represent the probability with which a particular state is valid and will be read out by, by whatever it is device that you're using to, to read out the quantum, the quantum state. Again, these are analog phenomena, right? Not digital ones. So that, that poses a couple of, of extra, extra challenges. So here you see the, the representation of what the readout, the measurement of the final result actually implies. So I have my, my initial uh, qubit here, yeah? and then I have a device that needs to read out. And, and reading out simply means you destroy the superposition. So it says you have two states, you want to read out, you'll only read out one state. Which one? Well, you cannot even predict actually which one. Normally, it is the one with the highest amplitude, with the highest alpha value. Yeah? And so here I have two representations, alpha 0 square uh, and, and alpha 1 square. And together, they make the probability 1. So it is either in this yeah, or and, and it's an and state, of course, in the superposition. So they, they, they are in those two states. But when you read it out, you only read out one of those states. So, and that will, that will, be, that will be explained uh, later, but what is very important to understand, and that is where there's really, again, a fundamental difference in what we classically do is quantum computing is non-deterministic computing. You say, like, yeah, what is that? Like, yeah, like, go home, Bertels, yeah, because, yeah, well, you're talking about crazy things. For me, it was crazy, yeah, and for Carmina and me, when we started in, in quantum, it took us a year and a half but it, actually, even longer, eh? because we're, I'm now five years in the field. She's four years in the field. We're still like 
wow, wow, it, it, it works like this and it works like that. So this is, this is really a fundamental thing. So non-deterministic simply means that if I have an uncertainty when I'm reading out the value, yeah, I may have to rerun the algorithm again and again and again and each time do the readout. And then you will get some kind of histogram with the, with the number of outcomes that, that, that your quantum device produces. And the one with the highest uh, frequency is then the, the right solution of your quantum algorithm. So that's why it's called non-deterministic, because that's what my friend, and, and unfortunately, yeah, as I said, he died. Samadhi said, like, no, 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 quantum, no, because we go to non-deterministic. What do you want to do there? Yeah? He's, uh, classically, we always know that we do something 10 times, we do something 100 times on exactly the same data, we always get the same result. In quantum, this is not true. That's why it's called non-deterministic computing. Yeah? There's also a second, a second uh, uh, um, aspect that I want to highlight is in-memory computing. Yeah? So this is then a representation of, of uh, uh, in-memory computing. Why? Because again, this is fundamentally different from whatever classically we do. Yeah? Classically, what you do is you have data in memory. I don't care whether it's terabytes or zettabytes, yeah? big memory. It's transported to a processor, you do something with it, and you transport back the results and put it again in memory. Fine, very good. In quantum, you do not do that. Quantum is in-memory computing. Yeah? And Said Hamdi Wee, who's maybe somewhere sitting here, yeah, we're working, we have been working, we, I started working, but then I moved out to quantum on memoristor. And memoristor is also a technology which, which allows in-memory computing. Now, what does that actually mean? Is that the, the qubits, they're, they're in a, some kind of chip, yeah, in some kind of grid and interconnected in a particular way, and I apply then the quantum gates on each of those gates, on e oh, sorry, on each of those uh, qubits. So the qubits do not are not being transported to let's say a quantum processor and then moved back to to the, to where it was. No, we we transport the logic, the quantum logic, and apply them on the qubits. So the qubits they stay there and they do not move around. Well, I will say other things. Yes, they have to move around for certain things, but yeah, but that is the core principle of, of quantum of quantum computing. So this is a, this is very important. So the power now comes. Why why is it? It is a bit of a hype. Yeah, I, I'm the first to say that quantum is maybe too much of a hype, and I will give other examples in which I say like, yeah, well, don't believe everybody. Yeah, and you don't have to believe me either. Yeah, but I do know that it's it's sometimes heavily exaggerated. Yeah. I do believe, and I'm, there I'm very serious, I do believe that quantum is a fundamentally different technology I've never seen in my life. Yeah? And I'm already getting a bit old, so yeah, I've seen, I've seen quite a lot of things. But quant something like quantum, no, this is completely new. Yeah? And we're still only at the, at the beginning. So where does the power come from? Let's assume that we can combine bits classically. Okay? So that we have... Uh, we can combine, let's say, up to three bits. So it goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, up to 1, 1, 1. Yeah? So we have n bits, they hold yeah, 2 to the power n minus 1 kind of uh, uh, combinations and, and data elements. But it's in an exclusive OR way. So either you're there, or you're there, or you're there. Yeah, that's, that's how it classically works. If you want to do it in a, in a, in a quantum way, yeah, again, we can combine three qubits. Three qubits. So again, I have zero, zero, zero up to one, one, one. You see all of the amplitudes, the alphas, yeah, from alphas. Oh, sorry. Hola. Yep. Oh, yep. Sorry. Yeah, that was not intentional. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So here you see again all of the alphas, yeah, because these are the amplitudes with which this particular yeah, state will be read out. And in a non-deterministic way, right? It's, it's not a single execution. No, it's m maybe 10 times, maybe 100 times. If somebody says it needs to be 1,000 times, nobody knows. Yeah? Well, I can say nobody knows. I've not, not met any single person who convinces me it's only 10 or it's 100. Nobody really knows. But it, it is non-deterministic. That's the only thing we do know. Yeah? And again, I have... Uh, not exclusive ORs, but these are pluses. These are the AND operations again. So all those eight states here are, are, can be used at the same time to apply any kind of quantum logic on those eight states, and they go on those eight states in parallel. This is a fundamental difference. So quantum physics gives me massive parallelism 
I would like to say for free, but the principle is indeed for free, yeah? But uh, I have to explain a little bit that we're far from that, that free, but yeah, this is really a, an important thing that n qubits, they hold two to the power n values. And I will, I will highlight those a little bit. Yeah, this is, a, this is a, a bit of an example that we showed of how to serially look for, for a particular uh, uh, number, let's say 110, yeah, in a classical way. But you can also do that in a, in a quantum way. So that means you move all of those eight states at the same time to, let's say, the quantum device, quantum computer, and immediately you say, this is the result. And in this case, of course, it's, it's the same result. So what, is the, what does that actually mean yeah, in terms from algorithms? Are, do we have many quantum algorithms? Well, certain people say, yeah, sure. I say, no. Yeah? Why? Do I know everything? No, but I'm a computer engineer, so we want to build a real working uh, situation. And I will give you one example yeah, uh, to which I will introduce then the third member of, of the team that is here, yeah, Aritra. Yeah, but I will raise his hand, I will ask him to raise his hand, not now, but later. Yeah? So, but uh, this is how a quantum algorithm in principle goes. So the starting point is indeed yeah, the, initial, the initial values of the amplitudes, yeah? again from zero, always the same three bits uh, or by qubits that we use. Yeah? So I have eight, eight same states of, of the amplitudes, and then I start operating the quantum logic. And then one of those amplitudes, they will start differentiating from the others, and they will become bigger. Negative, positive, whatever it is, that, that, that's not that important. Yeah? But you see, after, uh, after a, s a series of operations, yeah, you, you can do a readout of this final state in a non-deterministic way. I keep on repeating the things that are very important to understand. Yeah? And then in most of the cases, not, not the first time, but you will read out in this particular, this particular value, which is the 110, as we already used in, in several examples. It, however, it means also that when I do a readout, I have also the probability to read out any of the other states here, anything. Yeah? And so that's why I have to repeat that multiple times so that each time, in, when I do it, let's say, 10 times, maybe in seven or eight of the cases, yeah, I will get the highest amplitude, and maybe in one or two of the cases, I get, I get a small one. But then at least I can, I can separate the correct from the, the, the wrong example. Okay? So this is, this is, I think, very important to, to, to understand. How does that now compare to all of the classical machines? This is a, this is a picture that I took from the internet. I don't, I, I don't really mention where, where it comes from, but I, I'm sure you recognize these kinds of pictures. And what is important to understand is that, that there is, there is a, 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 a cutoff of the, of the performance. So this is like 2005, yeah, 2005, it actually started really topping off and going, stabilizing, and maybe even going down again, the power, even though we kept on adding yet another processor, yet another processor. Intel, who is one of our big financiers, of course, of, uh, of the research in Delft, and only in Delft, yeah, yeah they, that, that's the moment, 2005, they decided, say, like, homogeneous, multi-core, it does not work anymore. That's when they decided to buy Altera, which is one of those FPJ companies in the US, yeah, for 17, okay, whatever the number, I don't, will not mention it, yeah, but they really radically changed also their own view in, on, 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 on computing in, in general. So we do see the number of transistors, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the number of transistors that keeps on, that keeps on increasing, yeah, but it tops off, yeah, all of the things, whatever it is that you're looking at, it simply tops off, so it doesn't scale as you keep on adding more technology. So what is it that we do in, in quantum? This, this looks like, yeah, well, whatever, it's not sophisticated graph that you, that you drew, yeah, but this is really showing you yeah, how the, the performance, the compute performance evolves, I have to say, in theory. Yeah? So let's assume here I have uh, the number of qubits, so from 2, 3, 10, whatever, until 300. And this is the compute power, so the number of parallel states. So let's, let's simply look at, at two qubits. So I have one qubit with two states, and I have another qubit with other two states, and I combine them, yes, in a superposition or an entangled state. I will not talk about entanglement now. So I have four states. Yeah, if I add another qubit, I have two to the power three, yeah, which has two, and then I, I don't have enough fingers or hands to, to, to show it, but then you have eight states that you're going to be having. Yeah? And if I have four, it's two to the power of four, and, and it keeps on increasing. So if I go up to 10, I have two to the power 10 of possibilities, and each time I apply a gate on that superposition qubit, 
Yeah, I apply them on two to the power n states at the same time. So that's where the massive parallelism, as I said, yeah, is coming from. If I go up to, let's say, 300 qubits, 2 to the power 300 is a number which I've printed there, but it's, it is bigger than the estimated number of atoms that we assume to be in the known universe. It's like, this is an incredibly big number. So that means, like, the compute power of quantum is simply extremely big, extremely big. So we have to, and we're not there yet, okay? But this is the, this is the theory. Yeah? So if we add one qubit, we double at the same time the amount of compute power for any computational device that we have, quantum computational device that we have. So 2 to the power 2, 3, etc. it keeps on doubling, 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 yeah? which is something we kind of know from classical uh, architectures. But this is really the way that quantum, quantum physics is working. Yeah? So this is, the, this is very important. The fact also yeah, that, that, oops, sorry, yeah? Yeah, that, um, uh, yeah, this is a new thing. It's the first time I, I, I give a talk with this thing. So that's why, uh, yeah, I press sometimes the wrong button. Yeah, that here, yeah, only one qubit. So if we, if we keep on adding one processor, does, do we improve the performance? No, we don't. Actually, as the shown with the previous graphs, yeah, we actually go down in performance. In, in quantum physics, this hopefully, I say hopefully it's not it's not going to be the case. Now, why do I say hopefully? Because there's still, yeah, do we already do we already know how to make all of these quantum phenomena, how to make all these quant computational devices? No, we don't. Yeah. Here you see an overview of the competing technologies, and I will not go into the detail of it. Yeah, but th these are the technologies that are that are currently various groups in the world are working on. And in Delft, we work on four out of these five. Yeah, namely the, the, the quantum dots in the superconducting, financed by Intel. Yeah, I have to uh, emphasize that. Yeah, the NV centers and the Majoranas. Majoranas, that group was bought by Microsoft. Yeah, and the NV centers, this is for, for uh, quantum internet. Yeah, uh, because this is based on, on diamonds with impurities, whatever it is. Yeah, so th these are, these are the, 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 the competing technologies. Ion, ion traps, trapped ions. Yeah, were very popular, let's say, 10 years ago, and then super, superconducting was, uh, came in, and that's, that's now, they're all in strong competition. We, as computer engineers, we try to be right above that. So we, I don't care in the end, I don't care what kind of quantum technology it, it will be built, but we want to be able to control everything, whether it's an ion trap or an NV center or a superconducting qubit, that's what we, that's what, what we really want to, want to do. This is just something I found last week. Yeah, something that I did at MIT. They make qubits out of graphene. Wow, yeah, graphene, yeah, sure. Graphene, we know that also from electronics has certain properties. Yeah? And, and so they, they try to use also to make qubits yeah, based on, on graphene. This is just a little, little side note. Why are we building quantum computers? Well, I gave the, the, the first slide, of course, is uh, my Elon Musk kind of, I'm a real fan of Elon Musk. Yeah? But there are also, let's say, more short-term kind of visions that we need to that we need to make on. Yeah, and I will I will mention only one later on. Yeah, it's one that we currently work on in our lab. But these are just examples of, of what people have in mind, of what what uh, what quantum technology could be used for. So I will not go into into the nitty-gritty detail because I'm not a specialist in any of those fields. Yeah, only maybe in one I'm kind of a, a bit of a, 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 an expert is, is DNA sequence. So that I will I will talk about that later. Yeah, um, decryptions. Maybe this one is, is is good to highlight again because I've actually I spoke with people from Polymi, Politecnico di Milano, I don't know where, where they are, eh? but uh, uh, they're working on, on, on post-quantum encryption. Yeah? Because if you have a quantum computer, it basically can break anything. The RSA that, that we use for, for, for encryption, it doesn't work, well, no, it, it still works, but if you have a quantum computer, bam, you can solve it. Yeah? That, that's, that's, that's a challenge. So that is, uh, that is maybe important to, to emphasize that this indeed is one of those fields because uh, before there was a lot of financing from the United States and DARPA, yeah? defense, defense agency, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? But now with, it's the intelligence agencies. They are the ones that say like, no, we need to put a lot of money into quantum because we need to be the ones who actually are capable of, of de decrypting all of the data that, that, that people want to interact with each or exchange with each other. Yeah? So that is, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, an important thing to, to know. I will just give you one example 
of this encryption thing. Yeah, this is Shor's algorithm. Don't care about uh, Peter Shor. He's a brilliant guy. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, but but this is just an example of how a big number, yeah, which is made out of the product, the multiplication out of prime numbers, yeah, is 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 the big uh, encryption kind of technology that we that we currently have. Now Peter Shor, and that's already maybe 20 years ago that he developed this algorithm. He can decrypt it. Yeah. And, and uh, so the only thing that runs on a quantum device is in this little, little red, red box, yeah? And I will simply highlight that. Let's assume that we have a Chinese supercomputer, and you know China is very strong also in quantum, very strong in, 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 in computer architecture. They had the most powerful supercomputer for years, China, yeah? And uh, so let's assume that we have a data center the size of, of Germany plus the Netherlands. So that's around 400,000 square kilometers, only a data center. And let's assume that we can put all of these supercomputers, these Chinese supercomputers, all over that, that, that particular place. Yeah, and have them compute, yeah, let's say the 2,000 bit number, like what are the, mil the, the prime numbers that will multiply with each other, you get that, that big number. That's what Shor's algorithm is basically doing. So if you do that classically, it would take you at least 100 years. It would, it would cost an incredible amount of money, yeah? And also it would use almost all of the Earth's energy in about a month. So is that a realistic scenario? Well, no, it's not. So that, that's why the encryption community said like, yeah, well, as long as we don't have quantum computers, we're safe. As long as we have big numbers, yeah, with these, multiple, with these uh, uh, prime numbers, yeah, we're kind of safe. Well, if we make a quantum computer, with a large number of qubits, that is something you have to, we, we cannot hide, yeah? Then that, that computation, that analysis will be done in about a day. And this is the, simply because mathematically you can prove that actually. That does not mean that, that any computer can do it. No, but mathematically, this is the algorithm to actually make Shor's algorithm execute yeah, in a reasonable way. But look at the number of qubits, five billion. Where are we right now? It's not like, it, well, it's, it should be a question to all of us. Well, pff, maybe we're at 15, 16, 17 qubits. Yeah, 5 billion, forget it. So we're safe for the next X years, yeah? So the, the, we're still really at the very early stage, yeah, uh, of, of making, making uh, quantum chips, yeah? But we try to also look a little bit beyond what those, uh, what those uh, 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 quantum computers can actually do. So. Where does the entire idea of, of, uh, of quantum computing comes from? As I said in the beginning, this comes from, from Feynman, yeah? who, is a, who is a brilliant physicist, yeah? and, uh, and he gave, us, gave a talk in 1982. So that's not that long. Well, for me, it's not that long ago. Yeah? I was already <laughs> professionally alive. Yeah? But uh, for many young people here, it's like, yeah, I was hardly born. Yeah? And that, that's good. But he, said, he gave a statement, say like, do we really understand what these quantum phenomena like entanglement and superposition, what they're all about. No, we don't. What, he said, what if we can make a computer on those phenomena, made that actually is built out of those quantum phenomena. So that allows us to really simulate and understand what the, what the properties of those quantum phenomena are. Yeah? So that was 1982, and that was immediately uh, launched the series of, of research yeah, in that field. So it's a pretty young field, that is, that is true. Yeah? And I, simply, I only want to highlight one term here, quantum supremacy. Because remember that, that uh, the, the, the compute power is exponential. Yeah? Each time we add a qubit, it's time to the, the performance. Another qubit, it's time to. If I'm at 300, so 2 to the power 300, it is a huge amount of data that I can process in parallel. Yeah? So that is quantum supremacy simply indicates what is the level of number of qubits that we need to combine with each other and that we beat any kind of supercomputer on this earth. And what is the number? It's very low. We say 49, let's say 50. 50 qubits, so 2 to the power of 50, then you need so much memory that there is no supercomputer in the world that actually has that amount of memory and is capable of processing all of the information. So that is the, the quantum supremacy, which is still a very hot item uh, these days. So, Whatever said like hour, that means like, yeah, I, I, may, I don't want to be bragging, but yeah, we, we, we in Delft, we're one of the few people, if not the only ones in the world that actually are looking at these kinds of phenomena, 
Yeah. So what has been done before we started looking at it? It's basically, yeah, quantum, quantum algorithms, some languages or the theoretical principles, and making the quantum chip. So really, two extremes uh, are, 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 are there. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, what, how, how did the entire research evolve? So now I give you a little bit of flashback on, on our own research, like when, when Carmina and me, we started working on it, and with Shang Fu and Savas Varsamopoulos, two PhD students, yeah, these were all the drawings that we did. Yeah, nothing sophisticated. Yeah, 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 I can do quantum physics too, you know? Yeah, but this is in the end, this is the picture that you will see multiple times, yeah, if I have enough time, cool, and then you, you, signal, you signal me, right? Uh, this, is, this is what we, what we basically say, yeah, if you want to build a, a quantum computer, and I will change my wording also later in, in, in my talk, yeah, is that you need to look at the quantum algorithm, the quantum language, we developed one, yeah, uh, the, the microarchitecture, the cryo CMOS, because you need to go from a digital to an analog and vice versa, yeah, and ultimately the quantum, the quantum chip. So this, is, uh, this, is why, this, is, this has been driving our research for the last five years. They say, yeah, well, this is not so sophisticated because we, I did that actually with, with FPGAs too. Yeah, it's, it's quantum logic. What? No, not quantum, sorry. Yeah, FPGA logic. What is the thing that you put on the FPGA? What is the language? VGL Verilog, you remember that? What is the, the chip design, the microarchitecture, and what ultimately on what, what it's running? I do exactly what we do. Exactly the same thing in, in, in quantum, yeah. And this is the this is our our full stack that we're working on. Okay, this on in red you see all of the things that we developed over the last couple of years. Yeah, OpenQL, CQSM, EQSM, yeah, microarchitecture. So that CBox, CC Lite, and of course we do have CryoCMOS. That is that is the work with Eduardo Charbon and Fabio Sebastiano. Yeah, and ultimately we do work also with quantum physicists on on a particular quantum chip. So this is just like an overview. I will not go into the details because I will be boring everybody. Yeah? If you want to know more, come to our tutorial. Yeah? But these are all the things that we've been working on and, and uh, that basically, well, the only thing we still do is the quantum, yes, and it's still also the, the, the microarchitecture. So I'm going to not highlight the details because it's hardly... No, yeah, you cannot really read anything, but, but that, that's fine, yeah? But uh, these are basically the components that we think are needed for any computational device that controls, uh, no, that ultimately sends an analog uh, instruction to the, to, the, to the qubit, yeah? So that is what we do. With whom do we work? And he's a very good friend of me. That's, that's really someone that I, that I got to appreciate a lot in QTech. Yeah, it's not that I don't appreciate other people, right? So I'm not, 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 not an arrogant, you know, maybe I'm arrogant, I don't know about myself, but he's a very good friend. Yeah, and he's, he's, a, he's Leo Di Carlo, sounds Italian, but he's Argentinian, and he did all of the fancy studies in, in the United States. And then he's, he decided to go into super, to making qubits based on superconducting technology. Yeah, and that's what we still do in collaboration with, with Intel. Yeah, uh, and he's the one that is one of the leaders in the world in number of qubits that he's making. So he's now finishing a 17 qubit chip, and he hopes to be at the 49 qubits yeah, uh, in, in, let's say, in a year and a half or in two years. Um, you also see immediately what the equipment is that he needs. And what is important to realize is this thing. It's like a barrel, right? And inside this barrel is this, the different layers. Yeah, and you see immediately like different temperatures. The K stands for Kelvin, yeah? and zero Kelvin is minus 273 point something. Yeah? And so this is really what, what is needed in order to have real quantum phenomena. You need to be at extremely low temperatures. Otherwise, none of the superposition or the entanglement or none of the quantum gates you can actually execute. So that is, that is his, that's his really big challenge. Yeah? And I just want to wanna highlight, yeah, this, is, this is the microarchitecture that we've, that we've been working on, yeah, which is actually this box here. You say, like, yeah, well, you're bragging a lot about basically nothing. Well, nothing happens in the entire experiment of LEO unless our, our computer that we make, our quantum device, yeah, says, now we do this, now we do that, this in parallel, this in... This is, this is how the, the interaction between the two disciplines actually works, and, and works very well, I have to say. Yeah? This is something that I had to add, uh, so Carmina said, yeah, but to show also the IBM thing, because everybody's like bragging. Yeah? And here you see the IBM Quantum System 1, what is it called? Yeah, the Quantum, the quantum System 1, yeah, very fancy. Yeah? 
it's just exactly the same as what Leo and, and, and we are doing, exactly the same. But it's like, yeah, maybe you put in a nice, nice box, yeah, but that's, that's basically, there's, there's nothing else to, to say. This is, a, this is the first year demonstration that we did uh, for, for Intel, yeah? Uh, that may seem like, yeah, whatever, I, I, we can do also a graph-based uh, uh, interface, yeah? But this, this, what is simply important to know is that, that uh, this is just one qubit, it's three years ago, one qubit, and, uh, and I said to Leo, I said, Leo, we should show to Intel what it is that we've been doing, yeah? And it was not like immediately I super, super happy about it because it's a lot of work and who is interested in these things? I said, yeah, well, it is very important. So this is not the best interface, yeah? Uh, but so the, the yellow ones are all of the gates that you apply, yeah? The red is like the measuring time, yeah? So now, now you execute and now you start measuring out and that's what you, in the blue thing, you start doing. Those are the measurements of the results. And then you do see, indeed, that the, that the, the curve yeah, or the error that you, that you have, the, the more gates that you, that you apply, it always goes to 50%. So it's basically a random walk that you have. Yeah, it's either this or that. 50% chance is x or 50% chance uh, 0 or, 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 it's, or it's a 1. Yeah, this is just, uh, in the meantime, this has become an extremely popular kind of tool, also in Qtech, yeah, and we have very fancy versions but I'm not involved in them. So that's why I, I don't even want to show them. I, I cannot show them. Yeah, this is the one that we started with yeah, that really highlights again how, how we, because this was done, yeah, the people from, from Intel were sitting there. One of, this, one of the CTOs of Intel was sitting in an auditorium in Delft. Yeah, and then the, the students, uh, Shang and, and Nader, they were, Nader was not a student, it was a post, okay, but uh, Shang was a PhD student. They, they, they demonstrated it, yeah, real life. So that was, that was for, for, even for the Intel people, it's like, wow, this is incredible, yeah? So now we, keep, we have to keep on doing that. Who are the other players in, in the quantum field? You see a, a couple of, uh, of highlights here, yeah? Google, Rigetti, um, IBM, Intel, those are the typical Microsoft ones, the, uh, the American ones. Microsoft should also be there. Microsoft is only interested in the Majoranas, whatever that is, yeah? Uh, I also mentioned here Alibaba. Because I already mentioned the Chinese are very powerful in quantum. Yeah, and Alibaba, uh, you know it maybe from, from well, if, if you go to China, then you will know Alibaba because they don't really have, I think, an offering in, 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 our, in our countries. Yeah, but uh, it, is, it is a very strong player in, uh, in quantum computing. They make their own quantum, quantum processor. Yeah, um, so that, those are the ones that I, that I do want to wanna highlight. I want to I wanna now, uh, for the... For the Remaining, I don't know how many minutes I have, Kuhn, so five or ten minutes, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm at slide number 30, so, so I only have like 250 slides, if that's okay with you, eh? so I still have some, some story to tell, but yeah. Uh, this is the full system stack that we always do. Now, do we really think about a computer? To be honest, I don't know what a quantum computer is. I think I do know what a, what a classical computer is, yeah, but what is a quantum computer? I, I really don't know what the properties are of such a machine. So I say, like, we're going to just look at it from an accelerator point of view. Accelerators, yeah, I've been doing that for 15 years already in Delft, you know. FPGA based, I already mentioned that, yeah. So I say, like, no, no. Yeah, and the full stack is something that also was, was highlighted. That was like six months ago when we were in, uh, I don't know exactly, was in LA. Nader, Carmina, and me, we were in, 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 uh, in, in LA. Yeah, and uh, there was a talk by, by Hennessy and Patterson. And don't tell me that you don't know these names because they, are the whole, they, they wrote the Holy Bible of Computer Architecture, yeah, in two editions. So they gave a talk, they had a, a big prize, and they gave a talk, and they basically said like, well, computer architecture, what, what can be done there? Ah, nothing, I think. We, I think we're basically there. But they said what you could, what you, what you could do is build a quantum, uh, no an accelerator for it, yeah? A computer accelerator. They never mentioned the word quantum, never ever, yeah? So they were talking about GPUs and FPGAs, whatever it is, and, they, 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 and what, but what was very important for me during that talk is that say like, you have to develop the full stack from the logic, yeah, to the language, to the microarchitecture, ultimately to the chip design. That's how you build an accelerator, be it for, for uh, encoding or, or decoding or whatever it is. That, that's how you make it. So, so like, wow. I thought I was like, this is a great confirmation of whatever it is that we've been doing in quantum. So I felt kind of reassured. So this is the big picture of how you make a modern 
computer architecture, computer machine, yeah, consisting indeed out of multiple multiple uh, F, well, FPGAs, TPUs, yeah, the TPUs from Google, yeah, it's for for machine learning, GPUs and FPGAs. These are the, the more classical ones. Why not? Why not also envision a quantum accelerator? Yeah, and that's the one that well, I, I designed it uh, because it, so I make it a bit bigger. Yeah, to to make a difference. Yeah, uh, it's not about bragging, but yeah, you have to make a difference. So this is how classical and modern applications are written. There's a, a core, let's say, of the main application that runs on, let's say, an Intel or an IBM processor, or or um, I don't know now what the name of the Chinese processor because they have their own processor, yeah, and that made then calls to all of the accelerators. So why not have a call also to a quantum device, quantum accelerator, yeah? So what are the challenges? If you go into quantum, what are the challenges? So I, I just highlight a couple of them. Yeah, is indeed again, as I mentioned, it's analog and and digital that you want to combine, that you need to combine together. So that is really a very very challenging thing. Yeah. Also, there is no microarchitecture that reasons about how to do that. There is none. Yeah. Um, the second one is that the error rates are very high. I already said those things. Yeah. That the qubits they have a very short life lifetime, but, but especially the error rates are very high. In classical CMOS, we we are used to working with 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16 error rates. Like, sure, we can deal with those. Yeah. There are various uh, uh, classical techniques of dealing with with errors, like also multiple bits that you combine. Yeah. And then there's a majority voting and things like that. Well, there is something similar in quantum, but you have to come to our quantum. If you don't want, that's fine. Then you have to read about it. Yeah, you can do something similar in, in, in quantum. Yeah, uh, Because in quantum bits, so qubits, the error rates are extremely bad. 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. It's like, wow. And then you, you, you need to go to 5 billion. Well, you should know why you need to go to 5 billion, but I will, I will explain that maybe some other, some other time. Also, the qubit has a very short life, lifespan. So this is, in, in a sense, not, not like seconds and minutes or hours and days. No, this is microseconds. Yeah? I'm just showing here the example of superconducting qubits, uh, 50 microseconds. And, and the measurement takes like 400 nanoseconds. So, this, so the time span of doing something, being something to do on, on quantum, are actually extremely short. So that is, that is really a, 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 an extra challenge. On top of that, all of the quantum gates, they're kind of limited in what they can do and how they can operate, yeah? and they're unreliable also in execution. Remember that we, I'm talking always about non-deterministic computing and things like that, so I have to repeat something multiple times because maybe sometimes you go a bit left and then times a bit right, and, but yeah, in the end I can make some kind of average yeah? so to, to, to get some kind of result. So that is, that is really very important to, to, to understand. So what are we now as a group in Delft working on? And now I will, I will try to broaden up the perspective a little bit. Eh? But we're working on developing a quantum genome sequencing accelerator. And now I do want Aritra to raise his hand. Raise your hand, Aritra. Yes, thank you. Yeah. He, he's an Indian student yeah, who, who more than a year ago, he came into my office and said, like, yeah, I want to do something on, on quantum, but it needs to be applied. I said, uh, uh, yeah. I said, like, okay, I said, like, quantum genome sequencing. And he said, like, I don't know what it is, but I'll do it. Yeah? Now, uh, close, your, close your ears, yeah? Because he's a brilliant guy. Yeah? But for a master thesis, he already analyzed and he identified this is, this is good, this is bad, this is the good mathematics. Yeah? He identified so many things. Now he started doing his PhD on this. Yeah? So I will now highlight a little bit what, what it is that, that, that we're working on. Yes, of course, it's a quantum accelerator. It is a health issue. Yeah? Every medical doctor that you will talk to and is kind of, let's say, hopefully modernized, yeah, they will say everything that we will do in our analysis and diagnosis is based on DNA, on the genetic profile of any human being. Yeah? So you, you, you have to reason in terms of that, that you will go to your doctor, not now, but let's say in 10 years, maybe in 15 years, and you have to put your, 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 your finger in the machine, the, your, one Illumina or a different company, yeah? and that will generate your DNA, and then the, the, the physical doctor, the medical doctor can, can do the analysis. Yeah? So that is, that is very important. Uh, our opinion, 
and that's, that is a very personal one, yeah? It is such an important technology, such an important mechanism, that it should not be the property of a single individual, of a single country, or a single continent. It should not be. It should be worldwide available for everybody. And that is, that is the, the reason why, why Aritra and our entire team are fo focusing very much on this. That's why also we say all of our results, they will become public domain. All of our results. It's not like we're going to take a patent on this or whatever. No. Public domain. Yeah, we're going to share it with everybody. That is, that is, I think, a very important thing that I want to emphasize. I will not go into all of the, the, the nitty-gritty details. Yeah? I will simply give you the example of, of what genome sequencing is all about. Let's assume that we have a reference genome, which in 2003 we first had for the human genome. 2003, so this is also very, very recent. Yeah? So this is an example, of course, of a much shorter genome, yeah? uh, of a reference genome. And then we have like short readouts, yeah? so that we have this Illumina machine or whatever it is. They read your DNA, and then it tries to fit in all of those reads into the, the reference genome. That is basically what genome sequencing is all about. It is the very first step that you need to do in any kind of medical diagnosis based on DNA. The very first thing. And after that, the entire process is maybe like, maybe like 20 or 25 algorithms that each time go into more and more refinement and analysis, yeah, classically. But you really need to have the DNA uh, done in, in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a good way, yeah, uh, classically. Uh, no, in, we hope now in a, in, a, in, a, in a quantum way. How does our work look like? Yeah? So this is a picture that shows how we organize ourselves, how we interact. Yeah, Leo Di Carlo's name is clearly there because he's a really a good partner in, in all of these things. Yeah, so we, we are really thinking, like, okay, how do, we, how do we work together? And you do see here that, yes, we work either with the superconducting qubits from Leo Di Carlo or also with our own simulator. Nader Kamasi, who is now at Intel, yeah, uh, he developed OpenQL and he developed also the QX simulator. And so now we want to use that really as the entire stack implementation that we want to share and this is this is also very important that's why i'm here yeah uh, we want to be able to share we want to be able to create a european community of of universities well, let's start with universities that all go into the quantum direction yeah making microarchitecture making quantum algorithms whatever it is so this is i think very important so that is so this this is really so this part this part with, with, the, with the black box yeah, is where we QCA, Quantum Computer Architecture Lab, it, are, we're working on, on those aspects. Yeah? So that is, that's why I show it here. Uh, classically, well, no, uh, our, our work basically means that we have to work on all of those aspects. Up to now, up to let's say the first three, four years, we never looked at quantum algorithms. Yes, we did a language, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, yeah, to, to implement all of the, 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 the low-level code that the quantum physicists need to work on. But now we say, no, we're going to move one level up in the sense like we'll, we'll develop our own quantum yeah, genome sequencing algorithm. So that's, that's something that has implications at all levels. Yeah? So that's why all of these layers are, are highlighted here. So I will now simply walk you through uh, the, the, the different layers. Yeah, we have uh, the quantum genome sequencing algorithm. This is just like, this is, if you, if you want to blame someone, blame me. Yeah, because these are just high level things uh, that, that, we, that, we, that, that steers a little bit the work. And maybe I'm completely wrong. And uh, I'll be more than happy to accept whatever suggestion Aritra and others are, are giving me. Yeah, but it basically means here I have my, my base, my readouts, I have my, my reference genome qubit, yeah, and then somewhere we need to match them. Yeah, and then we need to, yeah, and that's what we have to do multiple times at the same time. Yeah, that is, so that means we need extensions and changes to our language. So OpenQL, yes, OpenQ, Open Quantum Language, yeah, is based on OpenCL, yeah, with the C language, yeah, so, yeah. And, uh, and of course, we do produce some kind of quantum assembly, yeah, the, the, the Quasm, yeah, which was originally developed by, by Nielsen and Schwang for the book that they wrote on, on quantum computing. Yeah, to make all of the, the quantum chips, uh, the quantum circuits in, the, in, their, in their book on, based on LaTeX. Yeah, so we use the Quasm as our own quantum assembly language. And, uh, and we have like two versions. Yeah, I will not go into do two versions. No, we, we, for Aritra now, yeah, we just say we stay at the logical level. So we are working, he's working on, on qubits that are having a perfect behavior. So 
Otherwise, you have decoherence and, and error rates and, and whatever it is. It takes nanoseconds before, it, before it, it goes to the finals. You don't want to be there. Well, no, you do want to be there, but not, 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 not now, right? So we, we, I, I told Aritra, just assume perfect behavior, perfect qubits. They don't decohere. Yes, five minutes. Yes, I will uh, try to, to control that. Yeah. So that is that is, I think, a very important thing. And then later on, we, we may extend it uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, errors and, and things like that. This is just a high-level vision of what the microarchitecture might look like. And the only thing I want to highlight there is that we have indeed upstairs we have all of the DNA, the repository, the data, and that needs to go into our quantum accelerator already in a digital in a quantum digital format. And then ultimately, this goes yeah into, let's say, the, the, the cryo-CMOS kind of part, yeah? and ultimately to our QX simulator. Why QX simulator? Because there, on our own, let's say, Dutch supercomputer, we can go up to around 40 qubits in superposition and fully entangled modes. Yeah? So that's why no physicist can do that already, even though you have a lot of bragging by, by these companies, but they, they're, they're not there, OK? Um, this is something that I will, I will skip now. Yeah, we'll talk about it uh, to later today, yeah, which is uh, also the change, how, how, how volatile the field is, the really volatile. Because this is like hardly a year ago, John Prescott is a famous uh, quantum physicist. He said, like, forget about the surface code, blah, blah, blah. What Leo is the Carlo has been doing so far. Yeah, so like, because we need too many ancilla qubits, helper qubits, to interact with the, with the data qubits. So 50%. We, that, that's way too early, maybe in 10, 15 years. So that's why it is, again, completely changing the, the, the entire field. Yeah? It is also in, in implying our change. Yeah? This is another aspect uh, that, we, that we're looking at, and that's, that's Carmina's uh, work, yeah? is routing and mapping. Because two qubits, they're far away, and you need to do a two qubit gate operation on those two qubits. Well, you cannot do that. They need to be close to each other. Yeah? So you need to move them around in, into, into the, into the, 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 the map. Yeah? And we have a full stack implementation. Yeah? That's what I, what, I, what I already mentioned uh, before. So what is, uh, what is the way to conclude? What is TU Delft trying to do? Yeah? Are we trying to, make, to be the only ones in the world to do this? My, me, my personal opinion, no, absolutely not. Yeah? So what we do want is to share our overall system stack, and we're working on a version that in, let's say, two, three months, and that's why um, uh, Razvan, yeah, who's sitting there, he's, he's one of the key people in, in, in that part yeah, to make that happen. And that's, that's something we can share in our collaborative uh, uh, research. We also really want to, want to create an international, so above Europe, yeah? So Europe, uh, yeah, this is where Europe is, yeah? We also have people from, uh, PhD students from Morocco. Nader, I told you, was, was from, from Tunisia, yeah? We have uh, PhD students in Pakistan, yeah? Aritra is from India, and we have uh, um, Amitabh also from India. We have a lot of people from all over the world, yeah? And my, my personal opinion is, Go back to your country and start a quantum research center, and we will continue working together. That is what, uh, what we want. So we already have Shang Fu, who's back in China. Yeah? And I just highlighted the United States. Yes, of course, because of Intel. I'm very thankful for Intel. But there's also one of those national laboratories, yeah? the one in Berkeley, yeah? that wants to collaborate with us on building a quantum accelerator. And they're one of the first to actually talk about that. Yeah? Uh, again, you need to have. Uh, the, 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 the obsession, for me, it's an obsession to, to build the young people. So here I have like Razvan and Carmina. Yeah? There are two young people in, in, in my team. Yeah? And of course, there's Zayit Alars. Maybe you know him or you don't know him. But we have a lot. These are all of the young academics in Delft, in our faculty, who go substantially into quantum. So this is, I think, is, uh, is uh, very important. This is my final slide now. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is our current group uh, who is working there. I have to add, of course, Razvan now, because Razvan is very new in, 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 the, in the field. Yeah? And uh, so these are all the PhD students and, and the people working. Yeah? And these are Nader and Shang, who, Nader, who is at Intel, and Shang Fu, who, is, uh, who, is, uh, who graduated like a month and, or two months ago. Yeah? The first quantum student to graduate in our, in our group. Yeah? And he is now back in, in China. So this is really my final slide, Kuhn. So, so yeah, I try to respect your time. Yeah, um, what is important is that we, we, we need to start international collaboration. It is a really fundamentally new technology. It is much different than uh, GPUs, 
TPUs, FPGAs, whatever it is that you can name, yeah, or any Intel processor or IBM processor or Alibaba processor. No, it is substantially different. You really can reach completely new, new levels of, of, of computational power. And that's why I think it's very important that we all think together about what can we do to it. Yeah, and send me an email yeah, so that I, so we can interact uh, uh, with, with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quinn, for your very, very inspiring talk. A little bit obsessive, even as you mentioned yourself. Um, we have still time for a couple of questions. So, um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, Sandro. Thank you for your excellent speech. Um, we know that uh, quantum has a lot of, of impact on security because it breaks privacy classing encryption and because you can, uh, on the other hand, do the uh, quantum key distribution. But at the level of uh, quantum chip, how do you see the security? I mean, since we have a very high level of errors, uh, and when you uh, grow the number of qubits, probably the, 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 the errors sum up. I have the feeling that it would be relatively easy to mess up with the quantum computation is enough to modify one of the parameters and you don't have, again, a reliable reading. So if you have to, you know, to break a code, you try many times until you get the right answer. But if you have to run a, comp a computation and trust that computation, how can a quantum chip be secure? Yeah, very, very good question, because there's no way to break any quantum code. There is no way you can do that. I haven't met any single uh, theoretical or physical or whatever person it is that says, like, no, no, I know how to break anything. If, if, if two systems, they, they interact with each other on, on, let's say, this is the, 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 the code, the quantum code that we will exchange our information in, yeah, there is no third party, not a single third party that can try to sniff in and say, I will read it and I will try to decode it. No, because you will immediately see that someone or something has been trying to read and break your, your, your code. You cannot do that. Unless, of course, I cannot trust you and you cannot trust me. But then we should not interact in that way. Yeah? But if, if we do trust each other and we say we need to exchange data, whatever the data is, yeah, it is always secure. It is always secure. And I think, I know it's difficult to understand, eh? and it was very difficult for me to understand too, but this is really the way that, 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 that quantum physics actually works. So if you agree on the key and on the code, the quantum code, it is unbreakable. That's my, that's my answer. Kess Nader, Computer Science from Bristol. Um, I see that we're just at the start of, of figuring out what the architecture should be. But we know from classical computation that EDA and verification is actually quite um, an important part to make this practical. Do you see a role for this? Or in a, in a practical sense, how do you know you got it right? We don't. And it's not that we don't, we, we don't have ideas, yeah? But we, 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 we really don't know. That's why we made this full stack. And uh, I did not go into the detail. I'm, I may have some time later today yeah, to go into the detail. But it's really like at whatever layer you are, yeah, you can still experiment with, with version 1, version 2, version 3. Yeah, you, can, you can experiment with we want to be able to, to, to create our own benchmark, quantum benchmarks. So with data that you can send through whatever it is, run it on QX simulator. Yeah, so Analyze your, your result, do it multiple times, multi, uh, non-deterministic, blah, 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 all these things. Yeah, I have to. So we, we really have no certainty about that. The only thing is that we want an experimental platform that we can share with each other and, to, and on which everybody will keep on adding and saying, yeah, I think this needs to be added and this needs to be changed. That's the only thing. That's really the only thing. And anything else, I would be lying if I say, yeah, I know how to do it. I would be lying. And, and, and maybe I'll lie about other things, but no, I will not lie about that. Not at all. Thank you. So that basically means there's a lot of scope for verification and, and, and uh, sort of uh, tool it's support. Absolutely. For but like you. Absolutely. And it, it's huge. The, the amount of, of, of possibilities are so big yeah, that you really have to have a lot of very good compute power, classical compute power, yeah, to be able to experiment with all of the parameters that, you, that you're looking at, really. Because there are so many changes that impact 
at, at different layers, up or down. It impacts everything. So that is something. So all of the exploration, so the EDA community is more than welcome to look at to look at these things. More than welcome. Thank you.